Hello, everyone. Warmest welcomes to our webinar about a wrinkle in time by Madeline Lingle, our Holy Comforter summer reading project. I'm the Reverend Jimmy Abbott, the priest, the rector at Holy Comforter Episcopal Church in Spring, Texas, and I have with me Kim. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I am Kim Fosse. I'm the director of Children's Youth and Family Hello, Ministries everyone. here at Holy Comforter. Welcome to our Oh dear. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, just a little technical glitch there. Um, we heard a little bit of myself again, uh, but I think I fixed the problem. So uh, just a few words of introduction about this webinar. Number one, you do not have to have read the entire book. It is totally fine if you have not read the whole thing. It's totally fine if you have not even started. That is okay. You will at least get some background on what we think are the important themes, major questions, and opportunities for Christian reflection uh, through this webinar. Uh, as I said, our goal today is just to lay out some of the major themes, the big questions, um, some ideas that we had uh, about the book and, and questions that it raises for us. So let's just jump right in. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, wait, let me say, last thing, if you all have a question or would like to make a comment, please, by all means, do so in the chat function on the, the YouTube page. So, Kim, first of all, uh, you were the one who recommended this when we were batting around the idea for a Holy Comforter summer reading project. And, uh, you know, I said, let's read C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And what did you say? I said, um, well, um, everyone's done The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and everyone's read that book, which is true, and I love The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I love um, the Chronicle of Narnia books, but um, I thought maybe the Wrinkle in Time book would be a better fit, because a lot of people maybe haven't read that or haven't read it in a really long time, and there are some really strong Christian themes in that book, and I think we forget that, uh, because if we read it as a kid that didn't stand out and you know I feel like I have the privilege that when I first read this book I was an adult and so a lot of those Christian themes just stick out when you're you know as an adult you think oh my gosh I can totally see the scripture in that and yeah. you know Jesus in these words so that's why I suggested it because it was probably a book that most people hadn't read or hadn't read in a really long time and uh, there's some deep theology in there so there is and if you go back and uh, read some of the history of the publication of this book, there were some Christians who were not comfortable with it. And, and we should acknowledge there, there is a little bit of uh, uh, boundary pushing, especially when you imagine that this book was published in 1962. So as we'll be talking a little bit, remember, kind of put yourself in 1962 and, and imagine reading it uh, at, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. The first thing I, I just want to say is my favorite novels are the ones that have great first lines or opening paragraphs. Mm -hmm. So y'all know Moby Dick is my favorite book in the entire world. It begins with that classic, Call Me Ishmael. Okay. There is a wonderful line from one of my favorite authors, Raymond Chandler, in his novel Playback. Uh, the, the protagonist, Philip Marlowe, the detective, answers the phone and says, I'm old, tired, and full of no coffee, which is a <laughs> great line. And yep. this line is, it was a dark and stormy night. Kim, did, did that just like jump out at you like it did to me? It does because, you know, I feel like there's a lot of stories that kind of start like that. And you know it's going to be good when it starts off kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> foreshadowing yes absolutely so as i said we just wanted to walk through some uh, of the major themes and there are two scenes especially that that kim and i want to discuss it scenes that we think um uh, sort of are, are an ar archetype for the rest of the book and the one is this really memorable scene when meg and calvin and um, his name escapes me. The other guy. Charles Wallace. Charles Wallace yeah. are uh, first land on Kazmataz. And they're walking through this neighborhood. And it, 
it's this incredible scene, and I'm going to read. I'm going to read part of it uh, from my edition uh, on page 115 for what that's worth. Below them, the town was laid out in harsh, angular patterns. The houses in the outskirts were all exactly alike, small square boxes painted gray. Each had a small rectangular plot of lawn in front with a straight line of dull looking flowers edging the path to the door. Meg had a feeling that if she could count the flowers, there would be exactly the same number for each house. In front of all the houses children were playing, some were skipping rope, some were bouncing balls, Meg felt vaguely that something was wrong with their play. It seemed exactly like children playing around any housing development at home, and yet there was something different about it. She looked at Calvin and saw that he too was puzzled. Look, Charles Wallace said suddenly, they're skipping and bouncing in rhythm. Everyone's doing it at exactly the same moment. You know, when I first moved to spring, and began my ministry at Holy Comforter. We lived in Northampton uh, in early suburban development up here in the spring area. And I remember vividly the first trash day driving down the street. It's like all the trash cans mysteriously magically walked out to the curb in the morning and they all mysteriously magically left in the evening. And it does have this almost oppressive rhythm to it. And Kim, I'm wondering if you, you and your ministry, your life here, if you have seen a little bit of that, that sameness. Yeah, you know, I think about, you know, because I primarily work with um, children. I mean, I do work with their families as well. I, you see that a lot in teenagers, um, in the way that they dress and what is popular. And if you don't have that, there's something wrong with that. But you also see that in other churches' ministries as well, because as a youth minister, children's minister, you get to hear about other people's ministries and um, hearing things like, you know, children being in church, how they should sit a certain way and they should be quiet a certain way and you should do it a certain way. And if you don't do it a certain way, you're doing it wrong. And um, that in itself, I feel like just feels wrong because as children, there's not a really a certain way. There's not a certain way to play. There's not a certain way to be a child. It's just, you just are. So there's so many, you know, especially in young people, there's so many different ways that they're called to conform. If you don't look like this, there's something wrong with you. And the world tells them that over and over and over again. I mean, not just kids, but adults too, but you see it a lot in children, especially, or in youth, in the way that they dress in the things that they like. Um, the music that they listen to. It's all very, very similar. Yeah, and, and we should say that in the church, part of our, our goal, our purpose, our, our binding material is the creed, right? That is something that we'd all say that we conform to. I think part of mm -hmm. church and ministry, like you're saying, is figuring out how to be different within the creed. Um, right. To say, and I, you know, okay, so I'm going to talk about your son for a second. Oh, dear. <laughs> I remember one Sunday morning vividly when your son came to Acolyte with a green mohawk and Darth Vader shoes. <laughs> and, you know, I actually thought this is a beautiful, wonderful, incredible sign of the church that, yes, he's going to be an Acolyte. He's going to carry that cross or that candle, whatever it was. And he's got Darth Vader shoes and a green mohawk, but he is still part of something something larger that binds us okay. not just the the clothes that we wear that's right that's you know, your son, grew, isn't it? <laughs> yeah it is and it, it it's a lot of it stems from you know my childhood i grew up i grew up first catholic um and then being an episcopalian always being told this is how you should look when you go to church you know and always being in, incredibly uncomfortable and but you have to fit that mold because if you don't there's something wrong and i remember thinking someday when i have kids I don't care what they wear to church. I want them to be comfortable, but I want them to love going to church. And so a lot of that stems from that desire for them to love church and not give a crap about what they're wearing. <laughs> I also think um, uh, that, that, remember, this was written in 1962, that there is a subtle critique of two cultures happening right now that, that, that Langle is, is drawing out for us. One is the critique, obviously, of communism. Right. That, that 
you know, especially in 1962, you got to think Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. that there is this critique of uh, American perception of communism, that mm -hmm. everything is ordered and just so. And right. y'all have seen that. If you've seen pictures of, say, the apartment blocks in Soviet Moscow, holy mm -hmm. cow, they look like what, what she's describing. But there's right. also this critique of this budding American uh, suburbia that, mm -hmm. that it seems that y'all see this in our neighborhoods, right? Cookie houses. It kind of looks exactly the same. Mm -hmm. All the little and, houses and all the little families. Yep. Uh huh. And that, you know, um, <laughs> just like not all the houses are the same but they're awfully similar. They now, are. If anybody in the chat has any um, uh, thoughts and reflections on that, I see that we have both uh, kids here on the chat and some some um, older kids, if you will. And I'm just wondering if in, in, in your experience, if you have seen any of this, this um, desire for conformity where, uh, you know, communism is not our experience. It's this this other kind of conformity. If you have ever felt that, uh, one thing then uh, I'll say as y'all are typing it in, to then think about Meg, and, and this is a little bit of what Kim is saying, when Mrs. What's It says to 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 Meg that her faults will be her salvation which her faults are that she's out of conformity, right? With, with almost, well, this would be another theme, with our perception of what a young girl should be. Right. Yeah. Kim, any other thoughts, reflections on um, that, that our, our first sort of section there? Well, it kind of, it reminds me of something you said on Sunday about how when we are different, we're stronger. Yeah. And it's true, you know, we had that conversation in EYC on Sunday as well about the things that make us the same in that we believe in Jesus Christ and we all, you know, we go to church and those sorts of things and then the things that make us different and how boring and how horrible that would be if everybody were exactly the same. And you think about the Holy Spirit and how we were given all these different gifts. If we were all given the same gift, we wouldn't get a whole lot done. But it's really kind of amazing that we as the church have so many different gifts to offer. And we use those gifts for the body of Christ. And we use those gift to, gifts to raise up our communities. And, you know, it's amazing how God thought that through, even when we don't always think that. I, uh, so uh, that's a massive uh, subtweet there, Kim, of St. Paul. So y'all go home, read your St. Paul Go home, read First and Second Corinthians, and the, it, Paul's image of the body of Christ and each mm -hmm. having a different use and a different purpose and a different gift that we're all working together, but the eye is not the hand, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You can tell that Langel was a good Episcopalian. She knows her St. Paul. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I see some really interesting uh, comments here. I'll read one from Linda Blumberg. When we were in Poland, they called their apartment buildings built during the Soviet time, commie condos. That's, oh my. That, I never heard that, that's, that's, that's rich. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so let's get to another one of the pivotal scenes. They're on Kazmataz. Remember, they are searching for Meg's father. And in that main scene, when they're in the, the central intelligence uh, building, mm -hmm. it says that the brain is trying to get Meg to submit to it. It is the, the, this brain, this, this intelligence that is crushing everything into conformity by a rhythm. It says that even her lungs are being squeezed into this rhythm. And to break the power of it, she starts reciting the words of the Declaration of Independence. And we should just say here, that is not subtle at all, right? There is all sorts of irony uh, going on there. First of all, independence comes from breaking conformity. Mm -hmm. So obviously she's gonna read the Declaration of Independence. It's also, we should note that the Declaration of Independence is out of rhythm with human history because the Declaration of Independence makes that explosive claim that all men are created equal. And the way, of course, we now read that is all people are created equal. Right. So, so Kim, tell me a little bit when you were reading this uh, again recently, how did that scene strike you? 
it's you know especially with what's going on right now in our country it is so i mean it's almost as though god just stuck that in there just for this time you know it's it is so oppressive to have to conform it is so oppressive to have to um do things a certain way and and not being who you are i think it's a lot harder to try and pretend to be something else than it is to be who you are and that that scene the thought of her you know almost her lungs being squeezed it almost feels like that you know it feels like i'm everything in me everything about me is being squeezed out um and it's too hard you know my mom always used to tell me it's a lot easier to tell the truth than to tell a lie and it's true especially when we um when we are living our lives, it feels better to tell the truth than it does to tell a lie. I don't know about you, but when I when I have to tell a lie, it's like the anxiety that's in me, and it's just like, oh my gosh, I just should have told the truth, you know. And telling the truth, it's almost like it escapes you. It's like, oh, I feel so much better. You feel so much, so much, so much relief. And it's the same way with being able to step outside of that box of what people say you should be and doing and being who you are supposed to be even if it even if it's different i want to step over and make a couple comments about our chat uh, there is a question about what are the soviets great question we sort of just uh, uh, assume there but uh, the, the soviet union was a conglomeration of countries living under communist rule that that would be a sort of uh, command style leadership that was uh, mostly run by Russia from the uh, um, late 19 teens, early 1920s to the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, so uh, just uh, if you have any more questions, uh, uh, who's asking there, I took uh, multiple classes in college about the history of the Russian revolutions. So I will. Um, you Jimmy know, would love to tell you all about that. <laughs> and then, yes, of course, she starts reciting the periodic table of elements, which it, it also just a wonderful little little gift there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, during the middle of all this, Meg yell or uh, it says to Meg after she recites the Declaration of Independence, it says, "But that's exactly what we have on Kazmataz: complete equality, everybody exactly alike." For a moment, Meg's brain reeled with confusion. Then came a moment of blazing truth. No, she cried tri triumphantly. Like and equal are not the same thing at all. And that's exactly, I think, Kim, what you're talking about, that we are struggling with in modern society. Mm -hmm. How in the world can we, can we understand that people are different but equal? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is, is fear. When you don't, when something doesn't, look like you sound like you it's scary you don't know how to take it and so i think a lot of people's response is i'm going to attack it because if i attack it and make it go away it feels less comfortable um, i always used to like to tell people that i like to come to church so that i could feel bad <laughs> i didn't mean it like that but you know when you come to church and you and god speaks to you and you kind of feel a little uncomfortable it's like it's okay this is right this feels right if i'm if i'm always comfortable at church there's something wrong um and that's the beautiful thing about church is that we shouldn't all look alike and we shouldn't all think alike and that's one of the things i love about holy comforter is there are so many different types of people at holy comforter you know you have people on the far right and people on the far left and you have children and adults and older people and babies and everybody is just so different and you know i look at our youth group and and the different schools that they go to and the different economic statuses that they're all in and it's just they it's a it's beautiful to watch them get along and love each other and it doesn't really matter and i think as kids a lot of that doesn't when you're little a lot of that doesn't matter because um, you don't realize it's a thing um and as you get older it seems to matter more even though it shouldn't but um it's true being alike is not the same thing as being equal um so I have two kids. For those of you who don't know, I have a 10 year old and an almost 15 year old. And they always like to say, that's not fair. Why does he get to do this? Or why does she get to do this? And I always tell them, well, because one of you is older that, you know, he gets to have more responsibilities. And so he's able to do this and you're, you're younger. And so in that instance, they're not equal. 
I mean, as an ad- as an adult, I can drive. I can there are certain I can vote. You know, and as a kid, you can't do those things. And there's clearly reasons as to why you know a 12 year old can't drive. Um, but as we all become adults, we have to kind of look at that differently. We are all humans, and and I always love when people say we're we're all humans and we all bleed the same. We do. But when we live in a society where some people are treated differently than others, then we got to ha- take a step back and say, why is that? Mm-hmm. Kimmy, so better than I could have. Thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Let's move on to the, the, the last big um, section I wanted to pull out. Uh, one, again, just final theme. We're not going into all the little nitty gritty uh, of the whole book. But one last theme here is feminism, written in 1962. I do think it's interesting that the hero is Meg. It's, you know, usually in so much of literature, it's the the male hero. Um, So many of my heroes from literature have been men. I mean, I think about the, the Hemingway novels that I've loved. Gosh, I even mentioned Philip Marlowe, the detective at the beginning of this webinar, but but here Madeline Lingle really pulls that out. And we have to remember also in 1962, this could have been seen as uh, pushing the the gender boundaries. I think a couple of things in here is there's that scene where Meg lashes out and and tackles that guy, Mm -hmm. which we would say like, well, that's not a feminine quality that's not a feminine characteristic but i think what madeline lingle is trying to do is is subvert our whole idea of what what that means yeah Kim, as a as a woman how did this strike you you know it's always interesting i, I try to <laughs> it's hard you know living in this society that we do i think we've come a long way but there's still a long way to go um I think as a woman, I see things in a different lens than say my husband does. Um, I spent a lot of time, especially when our kids were little, um, trying to remind them that girls and boys are the same, even though we're different. You know, I remember my son saying something silly like, well, only girls do that. And my head whipped around and said, what did you say? And, um, you know, kids don't, kids don't know that, you know, they, they learn from what they see and you know when in their home their mom is the one who stays home or mom cooks all the time or mom does these things they don't they they have a hard time seeing it a different way and you know as a woman and as a woman who works in a church it always um I always feel very honored to be able to do that because there's so many churches nowadays that still don't allow women to do that and um I think really uh, heavily upon uh, my youth minister who is now a priest uh when I grew up uh, Becky Smith was uh I loved her she was an amazing wonderful model and role role model and she became a priest and um years later we had a reunion and one of our EYC members refused to take communion from her because she was a woman and I didn't get it at the time I didn't understand what was happening and then realizing that that's very real today where people still say well God says that women can't do that and that is so troublesome to me that anyone would think that God would think that women can't teach other people about him. Yeah. yeah and, I think and, that I always find that strange that it's crazy. Yeah. And so, you know, as a woman, I, you have to work harder because you have to, you have to prove that you're, I'm just as good as, and, you know, I feel very blessed to be in the diocese and in the church that I am because there's a lot less, I feel like there's a lot less of that because people don't see it that way. There, It's more of, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you teaching my kids about God? I don't really care if you're a woman or a guy. So yeah. Um, Brene Brown talks about this. Of course, any any Episcopal Church gathering, you're going to talk about Brene Brown. That's just like right. what happens. <laughs> you know? uh, she always talks about how the the goalposts for women in modern society are always moving. And you know, we we, we heard some of this too. That that um, uh, say. A woman in a professional environment when if she has a child if the woman returns to work the questions are how could you do that and leave your kid in a daycare yeah but if the woman um, doesn't return to work it's what kind of example are you setting for other young women out there and so we should just say that 
that unfortunately is part of the brokenness, I think, of our culture right now, that that, that goalposts are always shifting. I also do think um, one of my other favorite authors, Michael Shabin, talks about this, that for a man, the bar is crazy low. He talks about this one time he, he's with his kids in the grocery store and he's buying like, it was like a couple tubs of ice cream and some Lucky Charms with his kids. <laughs> right? And and the other person was like, I'm so glad to see you here with your children. And he's like, do you see what's in my shopping cart? You know, like it just the... And so we should just acknowledge that 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 is definitely still out there. And it, let's admit it, it's still part of, of the Episcopal Church. Oh yeah. When you talk about the stained glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm always really interested in the church pension group and their reports. And uh, clergy who are women are consistently paid less than their their male colleagues, right. which I think is it's just something that we have got to really raise and talk about. And again, I'm struck that Adam Lingle writes this in 1962. Yeah, she was before, ahead of her time. <laughs> right before women's ordination. I mean, before all of that. So Kim, in, in, especially in your youth ministry, how are you, how are you engaging, trying to empower uh, it, young women and young men for for leadership in the church, especially with all of this still out there? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I feel like kids are way ahead of us. I mean, students in general are way ahead of us. And, you know, you talk to them, we, we periodically have those conversations about um, sexism and feminism and you know, ageism and those sorts of things. And they kind of just stare at you like, what are you talking about? Because they don't, they haven't experienced things the way we have because for them a woman in leadership is not a big deal I mean how many female principals do you see a lot of them you know how many female school teachers do you see a lot of them and so I feel like that that's a huge thing for them to be able to see women in leadership and um, to be able to see um, people of color in leadership you know for them it's not abnormal at all for us it is because that's not something we've always known and so always keeping up that conversation I think is really important never just assuming that they know or that they're learning it at home because not everyone's home environment is the same i think it's really important to where when we model that leadership you know when they see that their youth minister is a woman um is important when they see um people of color or, you know, coming into leadership roles or being a deacon or being a priest in the church that you're visiting or in the church that you're at, and that's the norm, I feel like allowing them to see that and having that, having them understand what the norm is, then they become the proponents of that. And for them, it's just, this is normal. Why would we not do this? I think that's it, important. I, exactly. Uh, <laughs> again, uh, I feel like, I, I, wait, I just preached on this because I did, right? Yeah, it is. Really having a variety of people in the room is a gift because it actually it, it does I think uh, make us make us stronger. I'm seeing a lot of comments um, in the chat about um, uh, mom guilt, about issues around uh, feminism uh, and equality. Uh, again, this is a conversation that we really do need to keep up, and um, it, it's something that that I think we as the church have to to continually talk about mm -hmm. and. You know, this goes right back to Mary Magdalene seeing the first person to see Jesus on Easter morning. It, it goes back to, um, you know, the, the people in the New Testament, Kim, that, that you and I named our children after, right. mm -hmm. right? who, who were women leaders in the early church. And I think that, that continually raising up that viewpoint and, and, and that perspective is really critical. And I'm so impressed that it came up in in 1962 and that that meg is the protagonist and the hero which i think is great i should also say um that it, it, and kim i want to hear your perspective on this <laughs> and it's a complete subversion of christian allegory that the daughter saves the father right right usually yeah. it, it's the you know uh, it, what, what what did you feel when meg sees her father you, you know, it's interesting. In typical books, it's the child cries and the dad saves and you know saves the day and everything is fine. And in this, she gets angry at her dad. Um, and I think it's very it's very telling in that it's okay to be angry. And and I think for me, when I when I look at that, 
um, it makes me think about relationship with God. You know, in times when, God, I want you to save me, do this for me, 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 when God's saying, um, but you can do it for yourself, and I'm going to be here for you. And, and I think it really speaks to that, to where God is the hero, but God makes us the hero, too. Mm-hmm. The, the, and, and that's what we say about the Holy Spirit, right? The, the, the Spirit is an empowering agent, the, the empowering person of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just going to check um, that we have um, uh, some comments here. Uh, some comments. Um, this is a classic story. A young girl at St. Mary's, when they had two female priests, commented to her mom when they had a visiting male creature, Mommy, can men be priests too? Amazing. Isn't that amazing, right? It's, yep. it's talking about subversion, right? That's right. Um, and then, of course, uh, the the, the um, female characters throughout the Holy Scriptures, um, mm-hmm. and and so I want to say there there are lots of female characters uh, throughout the Holy Scriptures. It, really crucial, important, critical folks, um, and and so I, I do want to to continue to raise those up. And if you have any questions about who some of those characters were. Kim and I would be more than happy to, to share those with you. Yep. Kim, any parting thoughts as we conclude our time on this Lunch and Learn webinar? Uh, I would say if you've already finished A Wrinkle in Time, there are three other books in that series. Um, I couldn't tell you all of them. One of them is like a swiftly tilting planet, mm-hmm. many waters, and then there's one more. I can never remember the last one. But they're all really great, um, and I think people kind of forget about them. But um, if you haven't finished Wrinkle in Time, finish that one first because they all make sense better. <laughs> finish the first one. But, yeah, it was a great book, and I hadn't read it in a while, so I was thankful to be able to read it again. The conversation will continue. Holy Comforter Book Club meets tonight via Zoom at 7 p.m. If you would like information about going to the book club, I encourage you to reach out to anybody in the church office. Uh, we can get you connected with that. And we also plan to have some small group discussions about this at the beginning of July. Let everybody else sort of read the book. If you want to keep, uh, if you wanted to read it again, or perhaps read the rest of the, the quartet, you would be more than welcome to do so. So I want to thank everybody for all of your comments, for the chats. If, again, you have any comments, questions, by all means, reach out to Kim and I, and we would love to be in touch. I thought that was